The Moon Presence is a nameless great one in the world of Bloodborne, a being synonymous with the Blood Moon, pale blood and the likely source of the hunter's dream. Its actions are the primary instigator and driving force behind many of the events and situations that have arisen in Yarnum and throughout that world's history. The Moon Presence is the main antagonist in Bloodborne. It is the master of Garmin and the great one that bound him to the hunter's dream. An eldritch being composed of human flesh and bone, with the exception of its head. It is covered in dozens of tentacles, mainly in its head, where they resemble hair and tail. Its body is mainly a large human spine and ribs. Moon Presence doesn't have a face, instead it only has a hole in its head. It's the Great One which created and rules over the hunter's dream. Defeating it will result in the childhood beginnings ending. Before being encountered by the hunter, the Moon Presence had bound Garmin, the first hunter to the hunter's dream. The dream is an outlet seemingly used by the Moon Presence to further its own desires, mainly involving the killing of the other Great Ones. Whether or not this has to do with halting the scourge of the beast, and the slaughter of other great ones is currently unknown. However, a note found on the upper floor of the lecture hall lends legitimacy to the idea that the moon presence is actively seeking out and trying to eliminate other great ones for an unknown purpose. Unlike most great ones, it does not have any blatantly malicious intent and even implied to be benevolent for the hunters. The umbilical cord in the workshop implied that Germain invited the moon presence in the first place due to not being able to cope with the loss of Lady Maria, who was the origin of the plain doll. The moon presence is absolutely synonymous with the blood moon. Whether it actually is the blood moon or whether it resides on the blood moon is unclear. When it is seen descending in the hunter's dream, it appears at the same time that the blood moon becomes visible indicating that when the blood moon descends, so does the moon presence. However, its physical form actually descends from the moon, indicating it is a separate entity, that the moon is simply a place in which it lives which it seems to exercise control over. Interestingly, the moon in Bloodborne does not appear to be in space as it is in our reality. But rather the moon seen in the sky is actually within the atmosphere, so low to the ground that clouds are able to pass in front of and behind it. The moon presence is perhaps then, a manifestation of the moon, a physical form for an abstract idea. The blood moon and therefore the moon presence have appeared multiple times in the history of Bloodborne. We know from the artifacts and descriptions found concerning the Thumerian civilization under Queen Yarnum that long ago the blood moon was seen in the land of Lauren. Its appearance, mixed with the use of old blood, triggered the scourge of beasthood. Beasthood was understood to be a contagious plague that transformed those afflicted with it into hideous and bloodthirsty beasts. In reality, it would appear that the proximity of the moon and therefore the moon presence mixed with use of the old blood is what triggers the transformation in humans and Demirians into beast-like creatures. The beast-like creatures which humans and Demirians become themselves have many physical and thematic ties to the moon presence's actual appearance. The beastly paws with talon-like claws the quadrupedal movement, the tail and the exposed ribcage all resemble the scourge beasts and silver beasts encountered in the waking world and nightmares. A similar phenomenon is seen in the citizens of the fishing hamlet, where its village men and especially the snail women strongly physically resemble Kos, a legitimate great one in close proximity to the villagers whose phantasms and blood were clearly being utilized in one form or another. Despite the unfathomable nature of the Great Ones, one clear goal seems to unite them all. All Great Ones lose their natural-born children through one means or another and like all Great Ones the Moon Presence appears to be primarily motivated with finding a surrogate to replace its lost offspring. With this knowledge in hand we can understand some of the events of Bloodborne's history with more clarity. The Thumerians were a superhuman race, more akin to Great Ones than humans are. Their queen, Yarnum, was the bearer of a special baby through the use of special blood. Special babies draw the attention of great ones who seek to make the baby their surrogate. By drawing near, the moon presence triggered the scourge amongst the citizens of Lauren, a Thumerian civilization, because of the great one blood which had distributed amongst the population. 
The physical death of Yarnum's baby in utero may have caused the moon presence to retreat, and thereby bring an end to the scourge for the time being. The rediscovery of old blood in the tombs below Yarnum by the scholars of Bergenworth once again set off a chain of events that would lead to the blood moon. The old blood was distributed to the population of Yarnum by the healing church, and the slumbering consciousness of Queen Yarnum's baby Murgo was awoken by the school of Menses through their ritual. These two circumstances caused the spread of the scourge amongst the population of Yarnum when the blood moon drew close. Whether the moon presence intentionally causes beasthood is unclear. However, long before the events of present-day Yarnum, the moon presence made a contract with Germen who became the first in a long line of hunters. The hunter's role was to hunt the beasts created by the use of old blood and the proximity of the blood moon. To absorb their blood and to have the lingering will of that blood channeled into strength by the moon presence's automaton servant. The fate of the majority of hunters was to succumb to the effects of the old blood and the blood lust it conceived transforming them into more dangerous and hideous beasts than any of their prey. As noted earlier, the primary motivation of great ones is to create a surrogate child for themselves, a legitimate offspring and heir. Towards this end it can be construed that the hunter's and the hunter's dream was created in order to artificially conceive of an heir for the moon presence. It is true that the fate of most hunters is to become a beast themselves, but there appear to be special hunters who are largely immune to the effects of the scourge. These hunters have pale blood flowing through their veins. In reality, human blood is separated into several groups, platelets, red blood cells, white blood cells and plasma. White blood cells are a body's natural defense against infection and disease. They multiply and adapt to squash out threats to their host. Perhaps pale blood and blood-borne acts in a similar way. Where this pale blood comes from is uncertain though. The moon presence appears to be synonymous with the term and the doll herself is filled with pale blood. Hunters come to the doll in order to strengthen themselves against the beasts. But as we know from the childhood's beginning ending, the strengthening of a hunter has the, perhaps unintended, consequence of drawing them closer in essence, and even appearance, to the great ones. Hunters are echo fiends, beings who imbibe the echoes or will of ancient blood to become more like a great one, a fitting surrogate. Within the hunter's dream there is a sole human occupant, a hunter who is trapped there without recourse. Garman considers the dream a nightmare, and being there torments him. Should the player defeat Garman in combat, the moon presence will reveal itself and descend in order to embrace the player to itself, in an almost loving way. Should the player have consumed the umbilical cords of past great ones, they will be able to resist the moon presence's influence and be reborn as a great one themselves. If they do not, then they will become a pawn of the moon presence, and in essence, its surrogate child, just as Garman was before them. This is the purpose of the hunter's dream and the moon presence's actions then, to find a surrogate for itself, like all great ones. The hunt draws those who are strong, the dream strengthens them further, transforming their weakness into strength such that they might become a suitable surrogate for the moon presence who seemingly orchestrates it all. If the player resists the moon presence, then it is a threat to the established order and powerful enough to disrupt it, so must be eliminated. In all cases the doll appears to be a tool, without willpower, though autonomous from the fate of the moon presence. It was created simply to nurture the hunters of dream, whatever form they may come in. A popular theory about the moon presence is that the moon presence is the source of the scourge of the beast. The hunter encounters the moon presence if they refuse Germain's offer of mercy and defeat him. The moon presence descends from the blood moon itself, even its name implies a deep connection to the blood moon. As we know, the blood moon rises whenever the line between man and beast is blurred. When humans succumb to the scourge of the beast, the blood moon rises, or perhaps it's the other way around. Perhaps it's that the blood moon rises causing those infected with the scourge to transform into beasts. At the beginning of the game, we find a note in the back of the hunter's dream, presumably left for the hunter, to escape this dreadful hunter's dream, halt the source of the spreading scourge of beasts, lest the night carry on forever. 
Now recall Germain's words to the hunter after the defeat of Father Gaskin. The moon is close. It will be a long hunt tonight. The blood moon, or rather the moon presence, is the source of the scourge. The potential for evolution exists within humanity. But whether they will ascend to gods or descend to beasts is unclear. If the moon presence, the blood moon made flesh, is indeed the source of the scourge, then it can mean one of two things. The first possibility is likely the most outlandish and controversial, that being that the moon presence is the source of humanity, which in itself contains the scourge of the beast. The second, and I believe more likely scenario, is that while the beast lies within all of humanity, it is not unless they are tainted by the old blood that they become susceptible to corruption and the beast takes over. It is when the blood moon draws closer that those who have been infected with the scourge will succumb to their inner, terrible nature and become monsters. Also, it seems that Hidetaki Miyazaki was inspired by popular culture to do with werewolves and their transformation on the moon. Another theory is that the moon presence is the hero of Bloodborne. The moon presence has a name, and her name is Flora. This adds much needed context to the doll's strange prayer. O Flora of the moon, of the dream, O fleeting will of the ancients, let the hunter be safe, let him her find comfort, and let this dream his her captor foretell a pleasant awakening. Flora to most people is what we call plants, and groups of plants in an ecosystem. You would think that connects her to the blood dew flowers all over the dream. But I think flora refers to the colony of bacteria that live within the body that protects it from infection. We know there was a great ascension, and most great ones left our plane of existence. Few remained, Ebriadas was left behind and became the church's blood pumper. Murgo's wet nurse remained to protect the nightmare newborn, but flora never seems to have a purpose. From a game dialogue, Garman treats Flora like a monster keeping him trapped in the dream, and she is scary looking, making her seem like an obvious villain. Here is where it gets interesting. The entire game is about menstrual cycles and the world is treated like the body. Everything is centered around blood, and birth, and eyes. Flora is our immune system. Even in the event of her kind ascending she chose to stay? She felt pity for humanity and wanted to rid us of the beast's scourge to remove what came when humans communed with the Great Ones. Think about it this way, she takes Germin to be her surrogate, and pale blood hunters are her enforcers that go out, and on her command kill the beasts look at every other hunter in the game. All succumb to the beast's scourge except the pale blood dream hunters, the player, Jura, and Eileen all three of us are perfectly normal. In Flora's vision we go out to hunt all the beasts, and leave the world safe for humanity to continue. The Yarnum Sunrise ending is the true ending. We as the white blood cell fight off the infection and at the end of our use Flora and German release us from the dream back into the world where the sun shines bright. The alternate ending is equally good. German is freed and we remain with Flora to watch over Yarnum, ready to bring new pale blood hunters in the event of a new scourge. But the secret ending that has us kill Flora and become a great one initially seems like the best. We have finally ascended to what Master Willem could never do, but in our selfish act. Flora is no more, the dream burns and the Yarnum collapses. Another theory about the motives of the moon presence states. If we only analyze the experience of our own character, we could say the moon presence wanted us to kill Murgo and maybe that there's hostility between different great ones. But since we know that many other hunters like Eileen and Jura have also been through the hunter's dream, and as far as we know haven't killed any great ones, what was their purpose? What was the moon presence trying to achieve by having them go out and kill some beasts, and by what terms did German determine they had fulfilled their purpose and killed them to wake them up? 